Welcome explorers, my name is Jasmine and we are so excited to have you join us here today for our virtual explorer experience with the San Diego Museum of Art. And this experience is exclusively for you, our annual pass holders and special members of the San Diego Museum of Art. Enjoy. Welcome to the San Diego Museum of Art. My name is Anita Feldman. I'm the Deputy Director for Curatorial Affairs and Education. I wanted to share with you uh, some of my favorite highlights of the collection and also some of our recent acquisitions. I wanted to introduce you to one of the real stars of our collection. It's a painting that was acquired just uh, two years ago in 2018. Um, and it's called Nymph of the Spring by Lucas Cronach. And of course, there's two Lucas Cronachs. There's the father and the son. And we think the son painted most of this picture in 1540, but the hand of the elder is also seen with really subtle, beautiful details of the face. The story is one that's really captivating. It goes back to the year 8 AD with um, Ovid's Metamorphosis, which is a Roman poem in 15 books recounting the whole history of the world as of 8 AD, right? <laughs> um, but this, one of the stories in there is the story of Diana and Actaeon. Diana was the goddess of the hunt. And you see above here, it says, I am the nymph of the spring, do not bother me. And there was this sort of general understanding that um, you do not gaze upon her or her entourage. Um, but Actaeon, hunter out of the woods, stumbled upon her and her entourage bathing in the woods, and couldn't help himself but watch. Um, and here she is sort of knowingly, you see, she's pretending to sleep, she's not really asleep. She knows she's been gazed upon, but she has to punish him. So he's turned into a stag, you see the deer here, um, and then he's hunted by his own dogs. Um, and you see the signs of what's left of Actaeon, the shield, the bow and arrow, and this fallen tree, a life cut short. Um, even the birds have this sort of shadow, shadow piercing the heart. Um, in Ovid's original story, she's surprised and embarrassed and splashes water upon him. And so it's sort of an accident that he turns into um, a stag. But here, Cronach has changed it around, so she's really the one who Okay, so Cronach had a very unusual way of signing his paintings. Here you see this winged serpent in the bark of the tree, and that's his motif for signature. Um, and in the background you have this incredible vista of this German city, uh, one of the very early cityscapes. So this is a, a great masterpiece by uh, Giorgione, uh, an artist from Venice. Uh, it was painted in 1510, uh, the same year that the artist died of the plague, uh, when he was only 32 years old. Um, it's an interesting contrast to the painting that we just saw by Lucas Cranach, which was painted in Germany around the same time, and you saw how stylized that was. And here you see this great softness and naturalism um, that typified Giorgetti's painting. Um, Giorgetti was also uh, influenced by Leonardo da Vinci, who um, came to Venice in 1500. Uh, so then the artist was only in his 20s. Uh, but he captured from Leonardo this technique of painting in very small stiplets that allowed light to seemingly emanate from the canvas. And that gives it a kind of lifelike quality that's very hard to pin down. Um, so it appears as if the painting, you know, the gaze, which is directly at the viewer, actually follows you as you walk around the painting. Um, it's actually nicknamed the Mona Lisa of San Diego because of this influence of da Vinci. Yeah, so you have this wonderful color in the background, very simple, very almost modern, you know, much contrasted to the Cronach where we saw the great vista with all the immense details. Here, Giorgione's softness and naturalism has a kind of romantic, um, but still a kind of mysterious, elusive quality. You want to get to know more about him. Um, in fact, very little is known about Giorgione. The uh, writer about the artist at the time, Vasari, is made some notes about Giorgione. That's all the evidence that the scholars really have. 
In fact, this is one of only four paintings that can be traced all the way back to Giorgione's studio. So today, experts in the Italian Renaissance look to this painting in order to authenticate other works by Giorgione. Um, Giorgione's work is frequently misattributed to Titian and vice versa. The two artists uh, knew each other very well. They painted um, some very large commissions in Venice together. They were both um, students of Bellini. And it's known that um, Titian even completed some of Giorgione's paintings after his death. So that just compounds the authentications even more. But this is one of only a couple Giorgione's uh, in the United States, and we're really thrilled to have it in San Diego. Great. So we're standing in the gallery for German Expressionism, which uh, is one of the strongest collections of German Expressionist art. Uh, in the United States, and we're really lucky to have that, that collection here in San Diego, uh, largely through a gift of a request through a fans in 2011. Um, this painting is by Gabriel Munter, one of um, the real pivotal figures in German Expressionism, and perhaps less sung than some of her male counter counterparts. Um, she had a very long relationship, a close relationship with uh, Vasily Kandinsky, the Russian uh, artist who was living in Germany at the time. Um, and together they developed a school called the Blue Rider in 1911. This painting, The Wooden Doll, was painted in 1909, just before um, they started that Blue Rider group. And it's really um, looking at how art can be an expression of spirituality um, by exploring color, shape, and form. You can express things that not easy to express in other, other forms, and also looking for ways that art relates to music and how all of these things are integral and connected. Um, so here you see a really simple composition of flat colors and shapes, and they all have a certain connection with each other and a kind of saturation of color and vibrancy um, because of this exploration of the spirituality color, shape, and form. This is called The Wooden Doll in 1909, and it dates from uh, just shortly after the two artists moved to a town called Murnau in southern Germany, which is a pre-industrial town. So they're getting away from all of the modernization and industrialization that was going on at the time and trying to come back to something simpler um, and looking for some really intrinsic truths. Um, and art was a way of doing that. Um, and we can contrast this work with a painting she made just a few years later. Uh, this is a still life with vase from 1914. Uh, and here you see she's painting very, very quickly. Uh, and instead of the clarity and simple forms and shapes that you had before, you have this kind of intensity, uh, this passion getting it out, you know, and it all has to do with really being um, super expressive. And she said her biggest problem was she couldn't paint fast enough. Um, and that all of her paintings were an expression of an instantaneous moment. She really wanted to get that through uh, to her paintings. Um, and she used a palette knife to do that because the brush simply couldn't work fast enough. Um, this was also painted the same year as the outbreak of the First World War. And uh, her partner, Kandinsky, moves back to Russia uh, without her. Um, she's left in Germany. Um, and of course, a few decades later, you have the Nazi era in Germany, and um, modern painting is forbidden. Um, and she ends up hiding uh, not only her own paintings, but Kandinsky's paintings and the other artists of the Blue Rider group in her house. Um, and although her house was uh, searched several times, uh, the paintings were never found, and this is a good uh, collection of her work today. So one lesser known fact about Gabriel Munter um, is that by the age of 21, she had lost both her parents, um, and she inherited quite a lot of money. And she and her sister then traveled to see extended family in the United States in 1898. Um, and she went to Arkansas and Missouri and Texas. Um, and 
Maybe somehow what she saw there also influenced her development as an artist. Um, she went back to Germany to study painting, um, but she was not allowed in the main art schools of Dusseldorf and Berlin. Um, but because of her traveling and her uh, ability to not conform to the standards of the day for women, uh, she sought art practices outside of the normal academic training, and that really helped her develop uh, and really push boundaries as a modern artist. Uh, this is a sculpture by Richard Deacon. He's a contemporary British artist. Um, it was made in 2016 actually for the San Diego Museum of Art on the occasion of his uh, large solo exhibition here. Um, it's a wonderful work, as you can see, it's quite monumental. It's over 10 feet high, um, and it's called Under the Weather. And under the weather is a phrase used a lot in Britain to mean not quite right, sort of feeling unwell. Um, and for Deacon, it has layered meanings. So it also refers to climate change, the fact that all of us are under the weather. Uh, in the sense that we're all connected by the weather and what's happening with the, with the planet. Um, and the work acts as almost like an umbrella with its forms coming out and also like the rain cascading down. Um, it's actually incredible the way it's made. It's constructed of ash, wood, um, and in sections of nine, um, planks of wood that are bundled together um, and then steamed. And when the process of steaming is finished, um, you have two minutes to shape the wood. And so you see he's achieved these twisted forms by having the steam with the wood and just those two minutes, he's kind of been able to do all of this shaping. And then the forms are cascaded out like a telescope. Um, he calls himself a fabricator rather than a sculptor. And the reason for that is because he believes in showing how things are made. He's very interested in the actual making of things and in the materials used in making them. Uh, so in addition to working with wood, he works in lead and steel. Um, and in all of his works, you can see all the joints. You can see how everything is made. And it's made impeccable. So um, even all the seams between the wood and all the little details of the joints, you can see very clearly. So one of the greatest um, aspects of the collection here at SDMA is our collection of Indian miniature paintings. It's actually uh, the most comprehensive in the world outside of India. Uh, this is largely through a very generous donation by Edwin Binney III, who was heir to the Crayola fortune. Um, and a board member of the museum. Um, he made uh, this a substantial gift in 1990, 1991. Um, and this is one of the paintings from that gift. Um, anytime you come to the museum, you will see some paintings from the Beni collection, some of these wonderful Indian uh, miniature manuscripts. Um, this particular one is a detail from the epic story, the Ramayana, uh, which was written in the 5th century BC. Um, and it is actually at the end of the story, or close to the end of the story, when Rama, who is um, an avatar of Vishnu, hence his blue coloring, uh, is riding back on an elephant with Lakshmana, his half-brother, and Hanuman, the leader of the monkeys, the sort of monkey warrior. And Hanuman and Lakshmana helped Rama when he was in exile for 14 years, um, rescue Sita, his beloved bride, uh, from the clenches of Ravana, the evil demon, uh, with multiple heads. Um, and they had many battles, and there were lots and lots of adventures going on. Um, and here you see them riding back to the town of Ayodhya, where Rama is from, um, and he's going to claim his uh, throne there. And uh, the whiteness of the elephant is also testament to the divinity of the scene.
Uh, now the details in the painting are exquisite. This is actually one of the larger of the Indian manuscripts. Uh, so if you look around, you'll see uh, most of them are actually quite a lot smaller. Um, but the details are absolutely exquisite. Every little flower leaf is painted, the details in the face. We usually we have magnifying glasses so you can really get up close and see all the fine details that are very hard to see with the naked eye. Um, this is achieved partially by um, artists using um, a brush with a single hair. <laughs> Um, and the style, the technique was very different because uh, these paintings were made in workshops, royal workshops, um, that varied in style throughout India. And each uh, royal workshop would have its own group of artists. Um, and sometimes multiple artists would work on a single painting. There might be an artist who is very good at doing the flowers and another artist who is very good at do doing the facial features. And so they would work together. So it's not necessarily the hand of one artist. In fact, it's quite rare to have a single artist. Um, and they would have been pages of a manuscript. They would have been bound into something like a book. So you would have normally um, seen them by holding it in your hands or on a desk or a table. Uh, so they would not have been framed and looked at on the wall like we do today. So the reason that you might not see this particular painting, but you might see a different one when you come, is uh, that they are quite fragile and light sensitive objects. And um, due to uh, the light sensitivity, um, they have to be rotated and put into storage after they're on view. So uh, the equation is generally three months on view, three years in storage. So the fact that this is up now uh, means that uh, it will be uh, not seen for another three years, but there will always be another work on view that you can see. So we're really fortunate in the San Diego Museum of Art to have five works by Georgia O'Keeffe in our collection. And this is one of the most popular, it's the White Trumpet Flower of 1932. Um, she's, of course, very well known for her floral paintings, um, as well as other paintings of natural forms, such as animal bones and skulls, um, and other things that she collected and found out in the desert. In fact, in a couple years' time, we're going to be um, presenting a recreation of her studio here in the museum with those very objects. So you'll have a chance to experience her studio firsthand if you haven't been to Santa Fe to see it. Um, so here in this painting, one of the things that's very characteristic of her work is this immense blow-up, this sort of focus in, so that you really see the form of the flower, um, as well as the color. It's all about color, shape, and form. And this is a way of getting inside the form, of really exploring it as an object, rather than just as you would normally see a flower as a very diminutive size. By really enlarging the scale, you can appreciate more directly the shape and form of the plant. Um, and it has to do with all things being connected in this world. You know, we wouldn't notice that flower so much if it was so small, but here she's made it very large. It also indicates her um, uh, interest in photography. She took a lot of her own photographs. She was married to the very famous photographer, Alfred Stieglitz, who ran the 291 gallery. Um, and you see in this, there's. It's almost like the, the enlargement and the cropping. These are characteristic uh, devices of photography. Uh, so that's coming through in her work. Now, at the time, she wasn't living in New Mexico when she painted this. She was still living in New York. She didn't move to New Mexico until 1946. But she was still having her summers every year in New Mexico. And it gave her some time apart from her husband, some time on her own. Um, and eventually, she acquired two properties out there on her own. Um, Ghost Ranch and Abiquiu. She was also painted the same year that she started a mural for um, Rockefeller Center. Um, and um, the mural was never finished. She had a nervous breakdown. Um, but it also shows the influence of muralism, uh, Mexican muralist painting um, that was going on in the United States at the time with artists like uh, Diego Rivera and Orozco and Siqueiros. John Singer Sargent uh, is an American artist, but he lived most of his life in Europe. Um, and he's also claimed by England as a British artist. <laughs> um, 
But uh, in Europe, he studied uh, works by Velazquez and Franz Falls, the great masters. Um, this particular portrait by Sargent has everything you look for in a Sargent portrait. Um, the loose brushwork, the incredible use of light, that sort of fluidity. Um, I mean, if you look at the face, it's not painted, these great gestures of painting. Um, the fur, the way he's captured the oriental carpet draped over the furniture. All of these are real hallmarks of uh, his skill as an artist and his pushing forward the techniques of modernism uh, at a time when you know everything was very you know rigid and academic and you know if you saw the Bouguereau exhibition here you know what I'm talking about in terms of the contrast between the classical salon painting and what's going on with impressionism and then with Sargent. You know, this is in 1892, so it's equivalent to the post-Impressionist uh, era. So he would have seen uh, the great French masters as well. Um, so this is actually a portrait of a young boy who's four years old, John Alfred Parsons Millet. Uh, he's actually the son of a friend, a very close friend of Sargent's, and was named after him. So uh, hence the name John. And the boy's wearing a simple nursery smock. This is a real change from portraiture of the day because historically, um, children of uh, wealthy families were painted very rigid and they were very dressed up. It was a very formal affair to have a, have a portrait done. But here, Sargent captures the life of a child. He's ready to get up and play. He's leaning over the sofa. He's got a little mischievous smirk going on. You can see the light in his eyes. Um, so, he's really captured the liveliness of childhood, and that's really uh, a big change. This is work by Holly Smith. She's a contemporary artist living in Los Angeles. Um, she came to the museum a few years ago and uh, proposed creating a new work for the museum, which would be a dialogue with one of the real stars of our collection, which is the 1602 still out painting by Sanchez Pokemon, which we see on the opposite wall, uh, called Quince Cabbage Mountain no Cucumber. Uh, one of the startling things about the Sanchez Pokemon is his depiction of the boy. You have this large black space behind this still life, um, and it's never been fully explained why he painted that boy, and prominent artists weren't really doing that sort of um, and also you have these objects on a shelf uh, that appear to be moving because the string at the top is not a straight line with the objects that they're holding, which implies that they're coming out into the viewer's space and there's an element of time and movement and the cucumber is coming off the shelf into our space. So Tali has picked up on these points in this incredible video work that she's made. So she's created this boy in her studio and filmed it and then placed the objects in it and taken them away. And at points in the video you hear her working, you hear the music she's listening to, and you have this sense of things that are changing and this idea of time and space in Well, I'm standing here with Tony Rosenthal's uh, Odyssey 3 from 1973. Uh, great, colorful work in modern materials speaking to the space race and the Cold War and um, just looking forward to uh, a bold futuristic new age with all this shape and movement. Uh, it's just one example of the many more things to see at the San Diego Museum of Art, both inside and out. Uh, so welcome and I hope you enjoy it. Today we have Anita Feldman, who is the Deputy Director of Curatorial Affairs and Education at the San Diego Museum of Art, and she will be joining us for our live Q&A. Welcome, Anita. 
Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you very much, Jasmine. Yeah, I'm like, that was so amazing. I loved being able to see the Georgia O'Keeffe pieces and the unweathered uh, sculpture. That was awesome. Okay, I'm glad you liked those. Well, those are some of my personal favorites too. <laughs> we have something in common. <laughs> so we have our first question. Um, which says, that was a great tour. Do you have, uh, do you know the history of all of the works? And like, sorry, <laughs> I, I butchered that question. One second. <laughs> no, no, I wish I did. We have, we have um, over 20,000 objects in the collection. And um, oh. yeah, there's quite a lot in storage. We try and rotate things in and out as much as we can, but we leave the main highlights uh, on view. Um, uh, and organize exhibitions from, you know, other objects in the collection. So things are coming out. A couple of years ago, we opened an area called Visible Vault, which enabled us to bring out 300 works from storage. So we are uh, trying to work on that. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of pieces in a collection, um, and uh, so I couldn't possibly know all the details about everything. <laughs> But uh, but I do feel I have um, a good overview of the collection and understanding of the, of the strengths of the collection. And of course, my own expertise comes from the modern period. Um, I was the head of collections at the Henry Moore Foundation uh, for nearly 20 years uh, and uh, on the authentication committee for Henry Moore. So um, if you have any uh, Henry Moores yourself or... <laughs> You want to ask any questions about Henry Moore? I can answer anything there. <laughs> Amazing. And um, someone said, I understand that the Indian miniatures being susceptible to fading, but even putting them away for three years before bringing them out again only delays the damage, I would think. Or do they somehow recover a bit of while while being in storage? That's a really good question because uh, the truth is um, all you're doing is prolonging the life of the object and that's our goal. Uh, so um, the damage is cumulative. Uh, it doesn't go away when you put something into storage. It just means that um, the life of the object will be longer. That makes sense, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you feel is the most prominent piece at SDMA? The most common piece. Sorry, is that what you asked? Most prominent. Oh, most prominent. Well, it depends what you mean by prominent. If you mean like the largest or the most important or... Um, I think when you when you we could, we could do both come up to the museum um, from the Plaza de Panama, um, probably the red Tony Rosenthal really catches your eye. You know, it's like wow. You know, there's this huge red uh, wonderful object. Um, but you know, don't forget to go in the sculpture garden. You know, just through Panama 66. You know, there's a really beautiful, peaceful oasis of sculpture. Um, lots of different materials. It's so beautiful in the San Diego light. Um, seeing all the different colors and materials together in the sunshine. Um, and that's a nice respite, you know, especially now during COVID. Um, you know, it's, it's a nice place to come and just relax and get away from everything. Um, and then coming into the museum, um, if you go upstairs, you'll see all the old masters, great European highlights, a couple small temporary focused exhibitions that change quite often. Um, and downstairs, we have our main temporary exhibition galleries. And there's always something exciting going on there. I love it. And years ago, there were a lot of cabinets and other examples of decorative art displays in the second floor painting galleries. Do we still have those or were they sold or changed for paintings or what happened? Yeah, so we have some decorative arts. We're, we don't have like a really strong collection of decorative arts. I think it's fair to say that, but we do have some good pieces and the, the best of those pieces we have on display in the visible vaults right now. So you see some of the um, uh, American pottery, um, as well as we're, we're going to bring bringing out some um, antique glass, uh, Greek and Roman glass soon. Um, we have uh, some of the Japanese netsuke, little carved uh, pieces. Those are really fabulous, the intricate carvings, really great pieces. Um, so, you know, it's a kind of um, mixture of collections, just like you'd find in storage. Uh, and that's the idea of having the visible vaults, yeah. Well, that sounds exciting. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, will you be displaying more sculptures outside? Oh, I'd love to. Um, 
<laughs> most of the sculptures we have that can go outside are outside, but um, sometimes things are um, undergoing conservation. Uh, we've got a work by Claire Falkenstein, who's um, a woman artist um, who actually made a piece for the um, pool that's in Panama 66 in the sculpture court. Uh, so she created a piece specifically for that pool of water um, and uh, we, we've been restoring that object. It's uh, coming back very soon and I hope within the next uh, month or so we'll be uh, able to reinstall that. Um, and recently we reinstalled the Noguchi Rain Mountain in the Sculpture Garden. So if you haven't seen that, it's a really, really beautiful piece. I haven't seen that yet, but I didn't, I didn't know that about the other sculpture as well. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. But things change from time to time with the outdoor sculptures. Um, and, uh, you know, that outdoor sculpture is, of course, a big passion of mine coming from the Moore Foundation. It's something I have a lot of experience with. And there's some great pieces there. Uh, really look at the, um, uh, the uh, Lynn Chadwick. Uh, it's the, the Watchers, uh, it really comes out of the Cold War period. It dates from the same time as the building that it's up against. Um, and, you know, it's all about how we need to look at uh, the media and the truth of the media. And, you know, it's so relevant to what's happening today and not just during the Cold War. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. And on the subject of limited display, how is it that some museums have permanent displays like the Mona Lisa? Uh, well, most museums uh, that have a, a history that goes back some time have collections, you know, and, you know, they have these pieces in their collections. It's very hard now to think about acquiring a piece like that, although um, from time to time there are examples of uh, great old masterpieces that, um, that do come up for auction or for sale through um, you know, private owners, but most of the great old masters are in museum collections. It's very hard to get your hands on them now, um, the cost and also the rarity. But uh, we were able to acquire the Cronach recently, uh, so that was a fa fabulous uh, exception to that, and uh, we're super thrilled to have it. Something like the Mona Lisa, um, well, you know, it's been in the Louvre and the Royal Collections. Uh, you know, the Louvre was part of the um, royal residence uh, in France. So, you know, that goes back to, you know, the uh, property of the royal family. Yeah. It's so wild. And I feel like it's also really hard to tell what pieces coming in will be that in the future as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I read somewhere that there is a sculpture by, I believe it's August, August Rodin. As, okay, as Rodin, yes. Rodin. Yeah, we have a great Rodin right outside the museum. Uh, it's on that sort of prominence uh, on, you know, just to the left of the Zuniga, you know, to the left of the stairs at the entrance. Um, so you'll see it, it's uh, the prodigal son. Um, it was taken from um, a, a smaller version that's on the gates of hell, you know, the great bronze doors that Rodin made. Uh, he made a number of versions of the sculpture in different sizes um, and actually combined that figure with other figures uh, to make pairs that are coupling. So, you know, changing the whole meaning of the sculpture completely, you know, into lovers. Um, yeah, but here is the story of the prodigal son who, of course, you know, comes back with his tail between his legs, so to speak, you know, um, <laughs> after having left home and not, not uh, fared very well coming back. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty rough. <laughs> it's pretty rough. I think a lot of young people know the feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <okay. laughs> um, are there any are there any major exhibits that are planned for twenty twenty one? Yeah, we always have major exhibitions planned. You know, there's no sort of we're planning all the way. You know, four or five years ahead of time. So, uh, so. Uh, we have coming up a great photography exhibition opening in November um, from a local collector, Cam and Wanda Gardner. Um, they have one of the best collections of photography uh, anywhere and we're thrilled to be showing highlights of their collection. So that's opening soon. Um, then we have um, an exhibition by Anna de Alviar 
uh, who does the most amazing uh, drawings in colored pencils that look like photographs. I mean, you just, you won't believe them. They're absolutely astounding. Um, and it's, it's titled Everything You See Could Be a Lie because it's all about deception in art. And there's all these layers of meanings. It's really fabulous. And then um, the big show at the, uh, in the summer is the um, great old masters from the Bemberg collection, which is one of the most outstanding collections of old master paintings in Europe. And it's coming to us from Toulouse in France. And uh, we'll have works by Cranach and Titian and Veronese and, you know, all the great names. Okay, those do you sound very exciting. That you have a lot, of, through, a lot of fun stuff up your sleeves. Yeah, that takes us through 2021, but I mean, there's more to follow. Um, we'll have a surrealism show in the next year, and then um, looking at surrealism and design, so the furniture and uh, objects, uh, as well as the paintings. And then, um, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, a little bit about Henry Moore and Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, recreating their studios in the museum, so you could see all the things they collected and what came out of the studios um, inspired from those objects. Oh, I can't wait to see those. Yeah, sounds awesome. Fun. And we're going to go ahead and just answer these last two questions yeah. to wrap up our Q&A. And our question is, what is the process like for an artist creating a piece for the museum, like the Richard Deacon piece? Yeah, so we were um, already working with him on a big show, and he was really thrilled to be um, having a, you know, a solo show in the United States. Uh, he's he's got his works all over the world, but you know uh, to have a big museum uh, solo exhibition is is a very important achievement for any artist. Um, and uh, you know he just wanted to thank us, and so that was how that came up about. He was making the sculpture anyway. It was the first of a series, and uh, he really uh, liked all the staff at the museum. He really enjoyed all the installation uh, team and. Um, it's an artist, you know, I've known him for many years. So, um, so anyway, so the gift came about uh, through that and, um, but they happen in different ways. Like uh, the piece that, the video piece we got from uh, Colleen Smith, um, you know, she came to the museum a few years ago with an idea. She said she was, you know, super interested in the Sanchez Cotan and this concept of the void and making a contemporary version of that or interpretation of it. And I thought, well, that sounds really intriguing. And I'm always encouraging contemporary artists to think about the collection, you know, because you want the collection to be relevant to today. And, you know, it's not just, you know, a dusty place of old objects, you know, they, there's, there's still something that speaks to us now, you know, and, um, and so I think having contemporary eyes look at um, historical works is really important. Um, and so uh, she made this piece and, um, and she, she gave it to the museum and it fits so well with our collection. We're, we're really excited to have it. They can, they can come in different ways. Yeah. I know. I love the expo exposition so much. It's so cool. <laughs> yeah. And our last question is building on a previous question. Can paintings on canvas be on display indefinitely, or do they have to have, or do they also need times of rest, like the works of art on paper? Um, well, they can be on display indefinitely. They're not at all uh, as fragile as the works on paper, although you still control the light levels, uh, but you don't need to control the light levels nearly to the same degree. So um, we're very careful about that, and you know, measuring the light levels for works on paper and and for paintings. Um, and we have, you know, UV filters on the windows and things like that, just as an extra precaution. And anything under glass has UV protection as well. Um, so, you know, you're okay with paintings, keeping them out. Um, but, you know, you don't want anything in really strong direct light um, because, you know, even the heat, you know, can damage things over time. So, you know, you just want to be careful where you hang things in your home too. You know, you don't want everything to be, you know, in bright light all the time. <laughs> That's a good piece of advice. I need to, I need to do that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Anita, for sharing with us today about the San Diego Museum of Art. Um, and are there any last things you wanted to share with us about the museum before we go? Uh, just to say, you know, really, uh, you know, we're here, we're open, and um, it's a safe place to come, and uh, it's a respite from everything that's going on. And, you know, you will find things that really make you think that you know provoke you 
but you will also find things that are very calming and contemplative. And so whatever kind of experience you're looking for, um, we hope we can provide it here. Awesome. Thank you so much again. Thank you. And thank you Explorers and other San Diego um, Museum of Art members for joining us today for our virtual Explorer experience. Um, for more Bubble of Park content, like, like live chat and videos from all across the park, visit culturalpartnership.org slash updates. And we hope you enjoyed this experience and we can't wait to have more with you in the future. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.